Excellent. So thanks for coming along. Uh, I know in Brisbane it's actually a, a public holiday, so obviously no rest for the wicked. So today we're going to look at just one of many ways of generating B2B um, leads using a combination of LinkedIn and Eventbrite. Now, I will, I will show you a couple of other tools as well, or just explain what they are and how they differ from Eventbrite. At, but yeah, there's one that's similar to LinkedIn and the, there's another one that's similar to Eventbrite. Um, and what I kind of find is that one, one set, so LinkedIn and it's um, international, uh, quite similar um, software platform, Shaper, they're really good for the start, the very top of the funnel, and then for converting people into paying clients. You know, sometimes you actually have to get offline and get in the same room and have a, uh, you know, a deeper and more, more transparent conversation with people, um, which requires, uh, you know, either Eventbrite or Meetup to actually get all the right people in the room. So I can, I can uh, unpack one of the ways that I've done this in the past uh, by providing quite a elaborate and exotic example, but it should show you a lot of the, of the, the principles um, so yeah, so you guys already know who Business Station is, so I don't really need to tell you. So we're a not-for-profit running the Digital Solutions Program, and you guys are all uh, part of that program at the moment, and you all know me. I'm more on the um, general side of things, so I'm, I'm not a, a specialist. I'm more of a general, generalist um, business advisor. And one of the core topics that I really like to tackle is, uh, you know, partnership building and business development and all this kind of thing. Um, so I can share with you some of the things that have worked really well in the past and have actually generated a huge amount of traction um, for myself um, in various contexts and also for, for Business Station. So that's really cool. Um, so, yeah, today I'll be showing you some of the, the ways that I generate huge numbers of leads and partnership opportunities um, for myself and for Business Station and also internationally. So um, I have come across a few founders who are wanting to actually internationalize their, their brand and um, start servicing other markets. And um, I was going to kind of touch on how that can, can happen. So say you've got COVID and you've got to wait for another six months or something, then what can you do in the interim before you hit the ground in, uh, for example, the UK or Europe or the US? Um, you know, there's quite a bit you can do in preparation of that. And also um, for um, most of your sakes, um, you know, customer discovery is always an ongoing process. Uh, you know, we've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on, on earth, we've got millions of different businesses operating, all with different models and opportunities and personalities behind them. Um, it's a hugely exciting world. Um, it's probably an overpopulated world now, <laughs> in truth. Um, and hopefully some of these tools are going to help you uh, understand how to get to the right people and in front of the right people in the right way. So I will explain just one funnel that you can set up to really create a lot of traction and without spending a lot of cash as well, I'll give you some tips about how to minimize the amount of spend that's required in order to generate this, this, this traction. Um, so this is a presentation that kind of, um, so, so there is a bias in this presentation. So what we are looking at um, is predominantly B2B. So obviously that was explained within uh, the, the title, um, but I've also gone for high ticket, high commitment partnerships. So if you're creating a SaaS platform, um, you might not be able to charge as much as, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of, of dollars of commitment or, you know, dozens or hundreds of hours of, of, of uh, kind of human resource 
commitment. So that's what can make these kind of business models quite difficult because you're kind of selling a low, lower ticket item because you know, people have come to expect a certain price range um, for software now. Um, and you sort of do need that level of intimacy of understanding. And so that's where the, the whole BC thing comes in because you need to get through that initial stage of understanding um, your customers intimately and then getting to a stage of scaling. And so that's where the, uh, the VC money helps you transition or to, you know, go through all those learning curves along your way to market and, and through the scaling process. Um, and that's what makes it so risky. So today I'll predominantly be focusing on high ticket and high commitment partnerships as opposed to low ticket, high commitment <laughs> partnerships, which are difficult. Um, there's, I've also got another bias and the, the bias um, or the, the, the assumption surrounding this presentation is that you would prefer to be independent of a brand and work um, under your own other personal brand or, or company brand rather than actually joining one of these organizations. So um, yeah, yeah, there are instant, yeah, most of the time the default option that a lot of established brands um, kind of favor is to try to internalize things, right? <laughs> um, so in this sense, we are going slightly against the grain by reading the market, using the job market, but not necessarily wanting to commit to a particular um, brand at a, at a point in time. Although you'd have to have that conversation to see whether that's acceptable to your partners or whether they definitely want you to be internalized or they're happy to go somewhere in between and, and take you on as a, as a contractor. And a contractor is still uh, an entrepreneur, <laughs> very much so, as they kind of shift between different roles and um, you know, take opportunities um, as they present themselves. That's actually a very entrepreneurial style of activity but it's, it's less of, of the extreme of being a, a consultant or you know, someone who's running a product company, uh, which is very much uh, the, 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 the sharper end of the entrepreneurial uh, marketplace. Alrighty, so let's run through a scenario. Um, and yeah, this is one of the scenarios that I've faced in the past. Uh, for those that know me, they know um, I've had a bit of an affiliation with the UK for a period of time. And one of the things that I was trying to do, um, and I know how to do it now, but you know, when, <laughs> when you're going through that learning curve, um, sometimes it's really difficult to understand how to best approach a new market. Uh, one of the benefits that I had, I think was, um, in, you know, and you can still do this without being a citizen, I think. Uh, you could definitely go into another market and then operate as an Australian sole trader or, or, or like contractor or, or proprietary limited or whatever, and then still create a, a joint venture partnership with a, a UK or US or European brand. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. But because I also had a citizenship that, that gave me a range of options that I otherwise wouldn't have had. Um, so today the challenge is how to create a new startup support service for the UK, um, having never been there before. So what would you do <laughs> in that case? Um, to, and this is the case that, that many founders are at, even in, in their own country, right? So they've come up with this new idea. Maybe they're not that, they don't understand the market that well or consumer behavior or company, um, company needs and desires um, in that segment or in that supply chain. So they kind of have to start from scratch. So this is like a, almost like a bootstrapping go to market um, process that you might find quite interesting and exciting. So yes. So when you're entering a new market, particularly during something like COVID, uh, everything gets you know, like um, mixed up, I guess. Like the whole, the whole market, um, you know, undergoes all sorts of weird distortions because 
you know, cash flow isn't happening in the same way through the marketplace as it was prior to the pandemic. So um, even if you knew what the market was doing, say two years ago, you've still got a whole range of new, new assumptions that are, have become assumptions uh, because of this, all, all of this kind of chaotic process that COVID has put the market through. Um, so the unknowns uh, on entering a new market like the UK is like, we don't know who the competition is. We don't know at what level they're at, you know, how, how developed their, um, the various businesses, the various not-for-profits, government agencies, all that kind of thing. Um, I, I can say from experience that the UK is more like a little bit more mature as, a, as an ecosystem than Australia. So this will be even more challenging than entering an Australian market with this kind of service. Um, but, you know, we might have more competition, but less market sat saturation. So there might be more competition, but there also might be more opportunity. Um, so we have to get a gauge of that as well. Um, we also need to get a gauge of who the main players are and how we can align ourselves with them or whether they're kind of brands that we want to actually compete with, like what side of the fence are we going to put ourselves? Um, and yeah, we, we've got no idea where their current opportunities lie. You know, it's, it's a complete black box to us. Um, so often what happens is, you know, the default thing to do is to um, just go and spend a bit of time in the UK and see what, <laughs> what the hell is going on. Um, but that can kind of be dangerous because you don't know how long it's going to take to learn all of these things. So it is much better to actually do some research before you, you know, uh, leave the country. So I, I'll, I'll go through a process, uh, like a nine step process now of what I would do. Um, based on my previous experience of doing it the wrong way, <laughs> which is making assumptions about what the market needed and the assumptions about willingness to pay um, and who my clients are and all this kind of thing. And so I've revised all those um, assumptions now. And now I've got a much clearer view of what I should have done and what I may need to do in the future um, in order to find my place into this market in a, in a meaningful way. So, so the first, the first thing I would recommend if you're in the B2B space is collect some um, quite granular market intel. Um, one of the best ways of reading what the market is doing is to see, um, to use tools like Seek and um, LinkedIn in particular and actually start to research what kind of opportunities and, and, and in what format these opportunities exist. So if we we're gonna create a new startup support service for the UK, then the kind of keywords that we might wanna use would include uh, things like innovation, accelerator, commercialization, startup, scale up, strategy, digital transformation. And what these variety of words are gonna give us is a really good understanding about who's hiring and on what basis and what is, what is the price that's being paid. Um, because often when we come up with an innovation, we'll come up with it in isolation of the market and we won't know really what's fair for, um, to, to be charging. But if we can look at what's happening in the established market and understand how we relate to that established market, then things become a lot more known as opposed to us having to just put a random pricing strategy together. Um, so, yeah, I'll just show you my LinkedIn and show you how this is done. So, cool. Ah, just doing some lead gen <laughs> just now in the background. So if you go to innovation, if you just type in innovation, for example, and then you go to jobs. And by showing you this, I'm not suggesting that you need to get a job. I'm suggesting that what people are recruiting for, they're generally interested in fulfilling a need. So this exposes a need and a desire to um, fulfill that need. Um, so for example, I've got a, that, yeah, once you do some research and you can set up an alert, so you get an inbox full of 
what's happening on an ongoing basis sent directly to your inbox. So that can really help. Um, and then you actually qualify whether this aligns with um, what you're good at or what your product does or what your services and, um, does. So business innovation, yep. Proposition development, yep. Stakeholder management, yep. Product development to a lesser degree, um, working in agile teams to a lesser degree, emerging tech, yeah. So this one's fairly well aligned. And then you go through and actually in the UK, there's 53,632 um, you know, different opportunities across the whole country. Um, most, a lot of them will be in London or somewhere nearby. Um, and then you, that exposes all the companies, right? That you might want to partner with. And so you might want to say, okay, well, love this idea, lo love this company. Um, don't want to work as an employee. Let's, let's open a conversation with them um, and see what happens. Then you could use the word accelerator. And the more you know your space and the language that your, your market uses, the more that um, you're likely to be able to kind of triangulate and you know, discover what's available within a particular market. Because often I think people assume that um, you know, between one city and the next, um, Things look similar, people take trains, people drive cars, people live in buildings, but actually the industries that underpin a lot of these different um, markets can be extremely different. So if we type in accelerator, we also we originate some other brands that we might be interested in collaborating with, Safety Tech Accelerator. So, you know, the UK is quite advanced in how it names its kind of innovation verticals. So uh, obviously in Brisbane, uh, prop tech is pretty big. Uh, I think Perth is more about res tech, res tech because of that huge industry um, that exists there. Um, and London is obviously heavily focused on fintech because it is the fintech capital of the world. Um, so and it's also the MarTech capital of the world, strangely enough, or the marketing, that they're actually the leaders in marketing as well. Um, safety tech, which I've never heard of prior to doing the search. So they're just make, trying to make things sound better maybe, but it's an accelerator that, um, so if I wanted to provide services, I could potentially um, you know, join this, uh, maybe I wouldn't take the job, but maybe I would contact them and see what other needs that they have that they need to fill. And, you know, potentially I'd be willing to provide those services to them. Then there's uh, global brands like Techstars um, and then Connected Places Catapult. That's an interesting one. So that's another accelerating uh, acceleration um, kind of service that exists in Camden. Um, and then the list goes on and on and on. And then there's another global name, Founders Factory. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. But these are quite sophisticated um, acceleration services. And um, interestingly, on a side note, we're seeing a shift away from founder-led innovation to accelerator and venture builder-led innovation. And so what that means is that I think many people have realized that it's very difficult to do a traditional startup in the traditional way. Um, you need a lot more resources than uh, typically available. <laughs> and so, you know, um, by joining one of these venture building organizations, you're able to actually tap into all of that extra support that's already pre-built and um, reasonably fit for purpose for accelerating, um, accelerating startups. So let's see if um, commercialization is um, a word that the market is using. So consumers might not be using it, but um, you know the the B two B market might be using it, and we're we're seeing that it is right. Um, this is a food and beverage brand, I believe. I think it's alcohol. Um, I think it does exist in Australia as well. Um, so potentially, if you're 
in that vertical, you might be interested in that. For me personally, you know, <laughs> innovating with alcohol, while it sounds like a bit of a party, is probably not too much to my interest. Um, and then, yeah, you've got other brands that I've never even heard of that just pop up here. And then all of a sudden they're on your radar. So your radar goes from a few key brands that you thought, oh yeah, you know, maybe this one, maybe that one, you know, the ones that you put in your pitch deck on, on the first cut. Um, but actually, if you look at a, a market like the UK with 65, 67, 70 million people, um, there's huge variety of different use cases for all of these kind of services. Um, and you've got to have a level of flexibility to align with market in that in that sense. So that's really exciting. Or oh, even Google and yeah, some wine. I'm not sure how sustainability executives kind of aligns with that, but anyway, um, yeah. And then you can just look at some of the other keywords as well and just see what is happening in this market right now. And the great thing about B2B partnerships, particularly for services, is that they can be quite lucrative. Um, whereas if because you're displacing the need for another expensive resource, right? Um, so yeah, this can be a really good proxy. Um, so yeah, so once you've done your, you know, searches on all of these various, um, you know, keywords, then you start to pick some winning brands, ones that you think actually wouldn't mind doing some work with these people. Now I haven't done too much due diligence on these. I'm, um, you know, Ford Partners sounds like it's a pretty good brand. A Founders Factory sounds like it's a really, really good kind of process. I've heard mixed things about Techstars. It's huge. It's internationally recognized. Um, I think they, they do the startup weekends. So that's part of their, um, I guess, brand awareness piece. And then there's a variety of brands I've never even heard of. Um, so the way I kind of manage, and then what I start to do is put these brands into like a CRM, okay? So I start to track these brands, particularly if, you know, they're, they're in a process of hiring. A process of hiring to me kind of suggests that they're in a growth mode, um, unless they've lost someone recently that they need to replace very quickly. So if they've got multiple hires, um, then that's a really good sign that, you know, their model is working and they're, they probably have budget to pay for, you know, new products and services to kind of, um, you know, be integrated within their business and actually create value. So actually what you're doing is you're latching, latching onto a known supply chain at this stage, as opposed to creating something that could be placed in a whole variety of different um, parts of the market. So it's all, it all comes down to the right market and the right place within that market. Um, so this is a really heavily simplified version uh, you know, of the kind of, kind of behavioral flow. I've actually got many better flows than this that I use to track our partnerships within, within the context of um, uh, Business Station, because we've got about 50 to 100 partnerships happening. Um, and so at any given time, there'll be opportunity to collaborate with one of those 50 to 100. And we're quite agnostic about what and, you know, who, who is absolutely really important. Uh, but what we do with them, we've got a range of, we've got quite a bit of flexibility around that. Um, so it's my job to kind of align, um, originate opportunity and then make sure it aligns with our kind of corporate objectives internally, um, and then kind of help uh, get it approved and implemented. So I'm, I'm, I've got a, a bit of a unique perspective because I'm on the procurement side of a lot of the collaborations that we do. Um, but everyone's got an overlord. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you are in the supply chain, no one is the king of everything. Um, unless you're an oligarch or, you know, some sort of dictator, in which case you've kind of created that. <laughs> but, you know, in democracy, in a Western democracy, um, everyone has a, an overlord. And so uh, Rishi Sunak is, Sunak's is probably the, the British public. <laughs> they obviously try to uh, judge whether he's made 
good decisions in regards to the, the, the budget of the country. So yeah, that's it's always worth keeping that in mind when you're creating a B2B product is that, you know, who, who is your overlord and what do they actually really want? Um, and can you create something with them? The great thing about services is there's a lot more um, flexibility. Um, one of the things about product is you're kind of committing to a core feature set. And until you really have that open conversation um, and people commit money to it, um, you don't really know whether you're on the right track unless you're really good at reading people because um, they'll often kind of demonstrate or show, show interest through their words, but not through their body language or their actions. So actions are super important and words and <laughs> words are significantly less. Um, so yeah, now we're starting to create a pipeline, a potential opportunity for where we can, um, you know, catch, you know, create a new service. And I think one of the ways of doing that is, is actually, uh, you know, you, maybe you've got an idea about what you're wanting to create. Um, and then you might do a couple of small projects for say tech stars and they get to know you, they get to like you. And then say you wanted to create like a clean tech accelerator, then you could start to um, create that using the resources of one of these heavily funded well set up organizations uh, in kind of like an aftermarket that's that's the kind of strategy I think will will work the best so the next stage is to <laughs> um, if you are entering uh, another market then you do need to look like the locals um, if you can sound like the locals that's even better um, so my unfortunately my accent does change when I go to the UK it becomes a little bit little less Australian and a little bit more British, <laughs> um, but not like that, hopefully. Um, and yeah, you just have to kind of slightly reposition yourself as you're entering uh, this new market. It could be your, you know, if, if you're entering the UK market, you might change your jurisdiction um, or you might get a, uh, one of your team members to do it or you might get a, um, a UK representative on the ground there to actually represent your brand as your entry market. Um, but it's important as we'll come to at the end to make sure that when you are doing all these activities, you are um, gathering huge volumes of um, market intel. Um, and sometimes, you know, outsourcing the, the business development um, task is a difficult one because it's very difficult to actually gather market intel in a, unless you've got someone that really knows how to kind of capture it and accurately report it back to HQ. So that's, that's one of the really big challenges. So we've undergone that change. Now we're not in Brisbane anymore. We're in London or Oxford or Cambridge or somewhere like that. Um, even if we're sitting in Brisbane, <laughs> Um, and the reason for that is we, we, we will start to add people and people typically are much more open to being added if they're in the same market and in the same industry, right? So if someone from coal mining adds me from the Pilbara region, I'll be a little bit more resistant to if someone from the management consulting or, um, you know, I don't know, accelerator world in, um, Sydney adds me. Um, and yeah, it's just a natural thing. I think we've got familiarity with what we know and we know certain places. So for me, Australia, uh, the UK, Ukraine are places that I'm very familiar with. And so I'll be a lot more open to connecting with those people uh, because I understand them. Right, so I always like to so here's an example of who we could potentially partner with in a capacity, but we don't know what they need just yet, right? So let's take a look at who they're actually recruiting for. Let's go to um, Ford Partners. Now, Ford Partners is a pretty cool um, kind of end-to-end -end venture building service, which is VC backed, which is cool. So cool kind of, Brand. 
Now let's look at the jobs just to see what holes that what major holes do they currently have? Okay, they they need extra business development for some reason. They need extra account management. They need extra marketing growth capability. Um, business performance analyst, who knows exactly what that is. Sales development representative. Okay, and then associate credit risk analyst. So that's very specific. It says I'm, I'm, I'm a top app. Applicant, which is probably bullshit because I don't know anything about credit risk. Um, so yeah, they've just launched that a, a week ago. So you might take a look and you might be able to see a little bit more about how they talk about what they're doing. That gives you a huge insight about what they might need. Um, so experience. Nice to have, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So you get an idea about what they need. So maybe they need extra leads for whatever reason, or they need better leads. So that's something potentially I could help them with, which is cool. Um, so with that in mind, at least I'm not going in completely without any intel on this company. Now, the le next level of understanding it are the people behind this company. So now we look at the structure of the company, you know, head of growth, marketing, yada, 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 investors, investors, all these different people. So what I might do is I might add all these people, although actually I should wait. I should change my <laughs> jurisdiction back to London and then I should add these people. Um, um, and when they look at my profile, it will be recognizable to them and they will accept me as a human being. <laughs> Uh, because I'm similar to them, right? So my profile will be saying stuff that's kind of along the same kind of lines. So if we look at this guy who might be the hiring manager of that position or that kind of competency, let's call it, then we can read about, you know, what he is typically interested in and, you know, oh, he's got similar um, experience, you know, he was a startup founder and maybe I oh, went to Imperial, yada, yada, yada. And you can learn a lot about these people. So you've got, say you've got about 200 people from, I don't know, 40 organizations that you're really keen on um, as you enter market in the UK. Now, you know, and you've added them all. The next step is to have a chance to meet them all. But what you don't necessarily need to do is hope, yeah, you don't want to become too successful with this event because otherwise there'll be too many people there and you won't be able to meet any of them because you'll be managing huge amounts of people. So I recommend maximum of say 20 or 30 people in attendance. Um, the great thing about uh, London is there's a huge number of pubs and they've all got empty spaces on the on the on the first floor, like one floor above ground. And so then what you do is you transition all of these people that you've met online and you know potentially are similar to, or at least present yourself as similar to, um, and you try and get them offline uh, so as to actually talk to them and actually get under the skin of what they need and what they want even more, right? So you try to create an event concept that they, they would see uh, benefit in, right? So most people like to network with their supply chain, particularly in the entrepreneurial space, right? So there'll be certain spaces that will be difficult to do. Maybe if you're trying to create a product for teachers, maybe teachers are not, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but maybe they don't like to meet with teachers from other schools. Maybe they don't see the value in that. Maybe they do, I don't know. Um, so I actually created this event at this exact location. Um, I created an event, something along the lines of networking for startup mentors, advisors, and coaches. And that's a really great way of bringing people <laughs> off the internet and into one place so that you can communicate with them. And then you can start to, to put together some sort of collaborative model. Um, and yeah, what, what, what I found is that um, the minimum spend to hire um, this kind of venue with its own bar, uh, we didn't have a bar person up there though, unfortunately. Um, we had to go and get the drinks from downstairs. 
um, was only about 90 pounds. So I pretty much bought everyone a drink. Um, and I think it was like 10 pounds a jug or something like that. So it was super cheap. Um, and we just kept bringing more and more drinks up. And I actually gave a presentation. Um, in hindsight, the presentation wasn't as good as it could have been, <laughs> just because I've learned a lot since um, from being at more and more events. And, and that's one of the real key aspects of, of um, gathering market intel. Like, are there events in your city that you can actually deepen your understanding of, um, of the market in which you're wanting to operate? And if there aren't, then that's going to be difficult because you're not going to be able to um, point blank validate, um, you know, what the market and what specific players actually need at, at a given point in time. So yesterday I went to the Sunshine Coast. Um, there was a there was an event on which was in the business support and startup ecosystem, and I pretty much met everyone. <laughs> and that's like forty or fifty people at once over the course of six hours. So it is pretty tiring, but. Um, that's really the way of picking up market intel about what is happening within different organizations, because obviously their circumstances um, change all the time and your opportunities to you know, do work with them or for them or um, joint venture with them changes continuously. And it's important to keep um, your finger on the pulse. And it's important also to see people multiple times. It's the first time you're like, removing the first layer of the onion and then the second layer and then the third layer. And, th and that's what, it, that's what, you know, pure tech startups, uh, it's very difficult to be able to know um, kind of, it's, it's difficult to kind of intimately know your customer base. If you're, if the minimum number of customers you need to serve to make a profit is like a thousand or 10,000, imagine, <laughs> Imagine, um, yeah, so that means that your customer base has to have a very similar kind of need at a point in time. And that's where the risk really lies is that you've got a thousand businesses all in slightly different scenarios. And, you know, you might hit it big for a while, like everyone might need Zoom between 2020 and 2024, but maybe the market will shift in 25 and then Zoom, it may not go out of business, but the alignment with market may um, be hampered by something which we, we can't foresee at this point in time. So yeah, we had about 20 or 30 people there and actually 20 or 30 people was too many for a couple, a couple of our um, event. And the reason was is you get some, if, if you're the organizer, then sometimes you're kind of caught between, you know, welcoming people into the venue making sure they're feeling welcome, giving a presentation. So that actually cuts you down from three or four hours down to one or two hours of pure networking. And sometimes that means that you need multiple people um, all collecting market intel um, and knowing what kind of questions to ask and knowing how to get to know people really well um, all at the same time. So we've done this and I think maybe Ram has come to one of these ones. So I pretty much created a similar event um, relating to a different kind of problem space. Um, so we created uh, uh, sustainability hard chat. We also created um, digital super connectors. Uh, we're thinking about trialing those ones across in Brisbane. Um, they're very clearly niche um, events. And so what you do is you create a really strong concept and obviously the one that we created in London was really strong. Um, we had about, you know, we pretty much didn't know 95% of the people that arrived previously at all. Like it was pretty good. Um, and people just kept arriving and they also bring, bring other people that might be interested as well. So the UK and particularly London is very much startup mad, right? It's, real, it's a real business city. Um, so people are really, uh, you know, going out on Wednesday night to go networking, uh, that wouldn't necessarily happen much in Perth or even in Brisbane. So, um, yeah, you do have to look at the city and what's possible within the constraints of what city you're in. Um, but yeah, this can work for 
yeah, this would probably work for in the, you know, in Brisbane, the Gold Coast, um, Melbourne, Sydney, um, maybe the Sunshine Coast. Perth, it would be a struggle, uh, but you could still, for certain topics like this one, it worked pretty well. Uh, so we have a lot of, we were having a lot of events. Then pretty much the key is to personally invite people to say, you know, you're a person of interest, not in those words, obviously. Um, you know, we're having this, would you like to come along? We'll have the chance to meet and discuss related topics and all this kind of thing. And so I typically try to use the uh, LinkedIn events page and then you can potentially, so I'll just show you this one and what the event, the events page, because you might do some market research on Eventbrite and Meetup and you might find that the event that you need in order to meet high volumes of, you know, the right kind of people. And we were having this discussion before, Sharon, about, you know, finding your tribe. <laughs> if, if your tribe doesn't exist, then sometimes you need to create your tribe. Um, you need to be that person kind of bringing people together. So if we look at... So if you create a company web um, presence on, on LinkedIn, then you can actually create these um, events. So past events, let's see. We've done quite a few. Here we go. Merging clean tech. Hmm, huh, where's it gone? It didn't work. There we go. So we had this in central Perth. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have 136 people attend, but I think Ram was there. So we had about 40 plus people, I would say. Um, it was a pretty good evening. And um, that means that people got to know us. They got to know a little bit about what we do and how we can help them and what's in it for them kind of thing. Um, and that we help this particular segment. Um, so yeah, it was a really, really positive evening. Um, so you can follow up. Um, uh, one, one weakness of LinkedIn is it's not a very strong event platform. So typically you're wanting to try to originate people um, by like sharing them. You can share, yeah, you can, when, when it's live, you can actually, there's a button that says invite and then you can, there's a whole range of tick boxes that you can just go tick, 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 tick. tick. All the way down um, and invite like 400 people or something like that and then a certain proportion of them will come hopefully not 100 percent. otherwise you're going to be in trouble um, but then the challenge is how do you get them into event right to actually um, because when people click attend on this one it's not a very high commitment attend it's just like an impulse they're like oh shit sustainability event tick even if it reminds them through Eventbrite, uh, sorry, LinkedIn, often they don't come. Whereas what we wanna make them do is actually have some skin in the game. We might ask for a fee, we might ask them for information. So if they don't really wanna come, then they're, they're not gonna go through and fill in um, some information that requires their commitment. Um, yeah, but that can uh, create confusion because then you've got two kind of quote unquote, ticketing systems. So Eventbrite's really good at kind of creating leads, but it's not good at <laughs> converting them. So you have to work, work out what the flow needs to be. Or you might, another way of doing it is you might write a blog about the event and then you might tag in the right people. And then um, you might have a link to Eventbrite to talk about, to actually get them to, to actually purchase or book tickets um, just depending upon what you're wanting to do and um, yeah try not to make it unless it's like an official event like try to limit the attendees um, to about 30 so your you and your team can actually talk to each and every one of them and gain proper market intel from each of them and I think you'll be your minds will be blown actually how much you can learn within one or two hours about you know the market, what it needs. And then you'll be empowered to work backwards from market instead of from product to market. You'd be 
going backwards from market to product. Um, yeah, so another comment is do make sure that you follow up within 48, you know, 48 hours just before the event. Um, and also I've seen people share the attendance list. Um, they don't share any contact details. They might just share the um, information of our LinkedIn profile, which is publicly available anyway. And when someone sends like a huge spreadsheet of people that have committed to attending, it looks great. And people are like, oh my God, this, is, this event's gonna work. Um, and they turn up. So I've seen that be used by Brendan um, Goulby of the Sunshine Coast really well. And so he, he's, he organizes events roughly between 80 and 200 people on a routine basis in regional, <laughs> in regional Queensland. Um, so he's obviously got the psychological flow really down pat. Um, so say you've had your successful event, um, the next thing to do is to actually, because you've got, hypothetically, you've got a whole list of people that seem to have an interesting profile, um, but then you need to validate that these people are interested um, and actually exactly what they're interested in versus, you know, what you think that they might be interested in. So learn about them, learn about their business, learn about their KPIs, objectives, all this kind of thing. Um, make sure that they're the right person to speak with. So I've hypothesized that this guy is someone of interest to talk to. So the CEO of um, Ford Partners might be a really cool person to kind of get to know. And um, often, often opportunity comes if you're proactive and you actually meet people before. So dig, dig your well before you're thirsty kind of thing. Um, obviously present yourself in a really positive way. Um, consider your personal brand and all that kind of thing. Um, and make sure that they're the right person in the organization. Sometimes you'll, this guy might be too senior, right? So we've had the situation that we've approached, you know, executive management, and they're just too busy to actually approve anything because that's not their role. They're just there to approve the approvers kind of thing. Um, so then maybe they will push you onto someone else that will actually enable you to get the deal through. It might be the event manager, it might be the business development manager, it might be head of product, it might be who knows. Um, yeah, th at that stage, you might have a really quick opportunity to talk about collaborative models. And the more experience you get with business development, the more creative you can get. And you almost like create a different, a list, almost like a menu for each kind of role that you come across. So say I come across uh, within my role at Business Station, like a, a president of a chamber of commerce, I now know that there are about four or five different things that they might be interested in working with us on. Some are like really low commitment, easy to do, um, mutually beneficial. And then there's others that require a lot more um, commitment and, and time from their side to get working. And you just have to be really understanding like what their exact circumstances are and what their budgets are at a particular point in, in moment in time. So it requires a lot of uh, sensitivity to these kind of things. So um, yeah, the kind of things that you're trying to work out when you have these sort of events is like, Firstly, like how the market is procuring a particular product or service or how that company is doing it. So each company might have a different model. They might say, okay, well, we would prefer if you're going to do this kind of thing for you to be an employee or a contractor or a consultant or, you know, or um, a product, you know, on the approved product list or something like that. So you've got to know, you know, what the likely flow from where you are now through to a sale would look like or a partnership. Um, yeah, and you also have to, have to get an idea about which part of your offer might work the best for them. So say you've got six different options, six different ways of partnering, which one is likely to align with their current needs the best? Um, so for example, now I've created a whole bunch of presentations. You're, you're, you're viewing one right now. Um, and yeah, I like, 
I'm not sure how many more presentations I want to create. I probably want to create, a, you know, three or four more, but I've created some really great content that I feel has a lot of different applications. And now I'm actually trying to find play, more places for I, me to put that um, kind of product and or that, that yeah, that content delivery um, as opposed to creating more content. And that's kind of a lazy kind of thing, but actually it's probably more effective overall. Um, so yeah, that's right. So I'm looking at different co-working spaces, different chambers of commerce, and I, I provide them like a smorkers board of different options of the kind of content that we can provide them and then they can choose and they can also help choose what kind of <clears throat> delivery model. So some, some of these, you know, incubators like, uh, for example, lunch and learns, others like evening events, sundowners, panel discussions, uh, workshops, webinars, you know, you gotta be flexible um, and you gotta know what your channel actually, or your channel partner really wants. Um, yeah, you, you need to know what, you also need to track whether there's the possibility of doing a deal and what the timeframes are regarding that. And all of these, all of this kind of market intel is really worth tracking within your kind of personalized um, customer relationship management system. So I've created one within Trello. I really, <laughs> I haven't really gone too far with it, but these are like some of my, my potential partners moving forward for myself personally, you know what I mean? Um, Cause you always have to look laterally and um, make yourself, um, you know, understand at all times how you fit into the market and how to align yourself with market. Um, so that's cool. Um, and then once you've met all these people, then there might be um, an information exchange. So maybe you'll have a set of flyers uh, about you or about service offering that you can provide. Um, and then you obviously take everyone's, you'll probably have everyone's contacts anyway, because they've gone through Eventbrite, you've got their email, you've got their phone number. Uh, they know you. And if they receive a call from you, then they're not going to freak out. <laughs> it's not going to be a cold call anymore. So th this is one of the big parts of um, BD is how do we make people know, like, and trust us uh, in quite a short space of time, right? So effectively by having an event, you're heating up 20 to 30 high value potential partners all in the one time. The only, I think the only barrier for some people is that they don't particularly like <laughs> hosting events. So in that case, you might need to get someone to help you in that by being the, you know, coordinating that for the brand and then, you know, choosing the venue and, and putting together a bit of a plan around it. Um, so sometimes, yeah, you, you have like an event partner that will help you. And sometimes that event partner will actually be willing to sponsor and you'll be having multiple brands related to that one um, initiative. Right. So after every event that I do, I draft, and I'm just about to do this actually, I'll probably have a bit of lunch after this session, but I went to yeah, Sunshine um, Coast like Council um, Expo, one of the expos, uh, which was like um, thriving through change or something like this. Um, so I've got, quite significant market intel on how the market is structured, um, 17 chambers of commerce, um, you know, what's happening within each of them, what kind of deals we're likely to be able to do with each of them, um, how interested they are in a particular, in a particular collaboration model, um, what's happening in all the other organizations that I already know, but I needed to check in with. Yeah, I'd love to write a quick report, it takes about half an hour. And then I will disseminate that through to my team so that they're all up to date with how the market is shifting. Um, yeah, and some of this information will need to find its way into your uh, partnership uh, customer, or it's probably partnership relationship management system as opposed to customer relationship. But I think you do take the point that partners and customers and clients are pretty similar. <laughs> 
Um, and often there, it's a combination of, there'll be like a client partner or a customer partner um, kind of um, role that they will take. Um, yeah, so that's really, really important to take. Um, and then, yeah, so say that I've followed up with five to 10 of the 20 to 30 people, because the other ones, I mean, they're, I send them a nice little message, maybe some generic information, and but I can't see anything moving forward at that point in time, but, you know, they're interesting people all the same. They're worth keeping in contact with to a degree, but they're not partnership material at this point in time. So with partnership material, then you organize your one-on-ones, right? With the people that are the most promising. And then you go really deep and then you try and polarize it to see whether you can actually get a deal completely over the line. But in this process, you're not needy because you've got all of these other options. You know, you've got another eight or so options to talk to. So the level of your desperation is very low. <laughs> um, if you, I love to take notes about every point that comes up in this conversation. I create a, uh, a series of minutes that um, is important to issue to them. And then we try to get to a point of agreeing a collaborative framework. Um, yeah, so, and that can take a whole variety of different formats. Um, yeah, and then it's just about closing the deals one at a time, making sure that you're serving their needs, but it, the deal is also fair for you. Um, sometimes you get caught in this kind of trap of, serving someone else's needs, but at your own expense um, as a startup. And that, that can get really tough, right? So you need to try to not put yourself in that situation. Um, so what not to do? Yeah, so if you're gonna reach out to people, you need to add value very quickly on LinkedIn. So you, in, you try to invite them to things that they're definitely going to be interested in or almost certainly. Um, but yeah, just by developing business purely digitally and expecting them to buy from you, um, you know, it does happen, but it's not, it's not what we should be expecting, um, expecting them to take specific actions. So you give them a variety of different options, but, um, if you invite them to something that is useful beyond just meeting you, it's meeting 20 or 30 other people that uh, also in their supply chain, then obviously they're gonna preference that um, quite a bit and they're gonna want to come along. Um, yeah, expect your marketing plan to be purely digital for high ticket items. So people for higher ticket items, you know, people already have to, you know, you either already have to have brand equity, like be known to be able to deliver or you need to kind of do a bit of hand-holding offline. So that's often the challenge when you're taking a new product to market. Yeah, business ideas in isolation of market. So one of the things that I used to do quite a bit of and still do is take content to market and to see how it aligns with what people are currently thinking in the market and what kind of questions come up and whether you actually get conversion as a result of your content. So it all comes down to communication at the end of the day and communication is related to how well you understand players in the market. <laughs> so um, every iteration of your, of your message is gonna get much better from one to the next, hopefully, if you're actually taking in this feedback and market intel. And yeah, you, hopefully you're flushing out a lot of your dangerous assumptions by taking your product to market as a, or your service to market as a, as a, um, as a content delivery piece. What to do instead? Yeah, try to add as many people in your target audience as possible. L LinkedIn gives you that B2B, or sorry, that P2P, person-to-person -person interaction. Um, and if you use it wisely, your friend, your friendship, um, group can grow very quickly. Um, 
Yeah, and it's about learning, doing your homework before you meet people and understanding who they are and how they behave and why they behave the way they're behaving and all this kind of thing. Um, invite them to, yeah. And if they don't want to come to an event, maybe a cyber coffee, you know, half an hour, quarter of an hour to half an hour of just a quick get to know you session. Uh, that can really be helpful. So after I organized this event, I got a few calls come through for people that couldn't attend, that just wanted to jump on the phone, do a bit of, um, you know, a discovery call. And um, yeah, I think I was, you know, this was two or three years ago. So it was too early for me to know exactly how the market worked in the UK at that stage. And in truth, I wasn't spending enough time in that market. So I wasn't really picking up um, enough, you know, my, my uh, ability, the velocity at which I was um, kind of collecting market intel was not high enough. <laughs> and I was trying to do it all myself. So that's kind of a bit of a lesson learned. Yeah, and try to add value, knowledge, experience, and connections to people. They really appreciate it. And try to drill into the industry as far as you can <laughs> um, so that you can really understand exactly how it operates versus how it appears to operate um, through untrained eyes. Excellent. All righty. So what we might do is we might, um, you know, have a couple of questions come through. Oh, we've had um, Thomas join our call. Hopefully you're well, Thomas. Uh, but let's start with, I'll, I'll meet with you in a sec, Thomas, but does anyone have any questions about what you've seen so far? Maybe just raise your hand. I'm not sure if you know how to raise your hand or send me a message in, in the Q&A chat. Or maybe what we can do is um, just to coordinate this better is I'll just go from the top to the bottom and talk to you guys and just perhaps just get either some feedback or a question or clarification. So we'll start with you, Raymond, if you wish to participate. Hello, you're talking about me or Ramon, right? <clears throat> no, I thought it was a good presentation. I am actually re reading one of the books that, that was suggested to me to read and you are actually almost inclining that I shouldn't finish the book because you already told me all of it. <laughs> it's very oh. much aligned. Yeah, no, it's very much aligned to to kind of like the conversations that we had. And um, and it's a matter of working through it. Uh, and it's it's not so simple as you have delivered it in the hour. It's um, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work to research. There's a lot of work to make contacts, initiate the contacts, find the right customers and then understand what it is that they're looking for or what it is they want to accomplish and see if you can tie into that. I think that's a, one of the main messages that I've captured. Um, and it, it's, it's a discovery process, actually. It is. And then it, once you discover it, you have to validate it. And myself, I'm a, very early in that stage right now, uh, working through that process, actually. Yeah, it's good, it's good that you're aware of where you're up to, because uh, often people go straight to the solution. And, no, exactly. Well, we're working on a solution, but it's it's quite clear that we need to target it, you know, and um, there's there's multiple ways of doing that, as in, do we go and very specifically target our, uh, I guess, main line, or do we try and catch the net a little bit wider uh, and then start talking to a lot of different types of, you know, whatever my application is that I'm trying to solve or uh, the solution I'm trying to provide to issues or pains that customers have. And there's a variety of areas that I can actually liaise with that my, that my product is, is uh, going to target. So in saying that, I guess what I'm trying to say is that catching the net, making it wide and, and understanding the customers, trying to partner up with them and make, make them come on board early. Mm. Yeah. My, my journey, in this market that you know, I'm currently operating in has been that at the start, I was literally talking to absolutely everyone. And then over the course of time, I know straight away where the value lies, like who I need to talk to, um, who's close to what we're doing um, and who's not. 
you know. So what we've found in general is that, um, you know, talking to stakeholders, um, mm -hmm. like the, for us, chambers of commerce um, and um, government departments, and um, those are the highest value interactions. Yeah, CCIQ uh, players like that, innovation hubs, they're the ones that we have the highest uh, value collaborations with. Um, and then there are certain, um, then, then come the small businesses and startups, they're like second tier. And then there are certain ones that um, we just know um, we, can't, we can't really do much with them. So over the course of, yeah, you sort of have to open the funnel at the start, be really open, and then allow um, those learnings to kind of sharpen your view about which kind of conversations you should be having and with who. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Thanks well, for that. We're, we're still at the fat end of the funnel. <laughs> yeah. 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 But have fun with it. Like it's yeah, uh, yeah. you know allow your curiosity to drive you into different parts of the market, um, and don't make premature conclusions until you've got enough mm -hmm. market intel. It might require you going to twenty or thirty events, and then over the course yeah. of that time, if if you're doing a sophisticated product like what you're doing, right? If you're doing a service and you kind of half know where you fit already, then it could just be a case of a couple more, um, you know, networking events or something that you've organized yourself or, you know, who knows. Um, but it's good that you're kind of aware that um, there's a lot of unknown unknowns at this point in time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. All righty. Um, I'll, I'll ask uh, for Ram's, Ram's input. If you'd like to, um, oh shit, I'm clicking all the wrong buttons. Um, Ram, how did you find that? Uh, it's very useful uh, for us uh, to send, uh, especially the market intelligence, customer segmentation, customer discovery. I think that they're very important, uh, critical uh, part of the you know startup process. Like so. Mm, yeah, and then of course targeting the customers through right channels, and then uh, you know acquiring them, and you know mm, so um, yeah. So I'm really you know uh, you know I appreciate the value of uh, uh, market intelligence and customer discovery and segmentation. Yeah, so we are in the process. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hopefully it's given you a few new tools to think about or a few new tactics to get in front of more people quicker. Um, also notice that uh, because it's B2B, I've used LinkedIn very heavily <laughs> to, to get in front of the right people. Um, so yeah, thanks for that, um, Ram. And we'll obviously talk soon. Um, Sharon, have you got any thoughts you'd like to share with us Oh, hi. Uh, look, thank you. It was a great presentation. I think um, it, it's such early days for me and I have lots of work to do. Um, certainly at this point, I'm really, um, I guess I'm currently working on my thought process around what the brand is and what it needs. Well, basically from where I currently am to where I want to be, and I don't know what I want to be yet. So that's, mm -hmm. so I think for me, I probably need to continue on my to-do list um, following mm -hmm. our, um, uh, following our discussion the other day and just um, keep chipping away at that. I think it will form, but at this point. Yeah. Uh, uh, my business and brand is far less sophisticated to what you're alluding to in the presentation, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Some of the principles can be reapplied for sure. Yes, but, I agree. Mm. But um, yeah, you're right. I mean, this is quite a sophisticated part of the market to try and serve. Um, yeah, but the key takeaway I wanted to leave all of you with is working backwards from the market to mm. the product to say, 
the market ultimately decides. <laughs> yeah, um, and I got that from our discussion the other day as well. So that was like, oh, okay, I've been going around this the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really it's a really common situation, and I think it's human nature to do it that way at the start. And so mm. reverse reversing. Yes. Um, yeah, is possible once you once you kind of pick yourself up and go, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Assumptions here, and I need to. Yes. <laughs> yeah i agree but thank you i enjoyed the presentation and you, you're right there's certainly um lots of work to do but i certainly had s s some takeaway messages from your presentation today yeah thank you thanks a lot sharon just quickly uh talk to tom tom how are you going Yeah, not too bad, mate. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. I've got a question for you. Is it better trying to find leads on LinkedIn or Facebook? Um, it depends on what you're doing. <laughs> um, what kind of business are you in? Digital agency. Digital agency. Cool. Um, well, it depends on what kind of customer base you want to serve. Do you want to serve? Um, do you think you're competitive enough to kind of serve um, higher value clients that are probably more accessible through LinkedIn, or do you want to serve small? Yeah, Facebook is really for like micro business, uh, indi yeah, either individuals, micro businesses, or the kind of the bottom end of small business. Um, and then certain industries, like certain industries, preference, particularly the you know the white collar industries okay. are going to be your. Uh, your LinkedIn and then the blue collar ones are going to typically be your your Facebook ones. So um, there's nothing restricting you from doing both, but I, I personally lean towards LinkedIn personally. But um, yeah, so it, it really depends on what kind of clients you're wanting to serve. Yeah, like I'm when I'm because I've had this uh, couple clients and that, and it's been the bottom end and that, and I'm like I've got some great um, stuff to do. But um, but yeah, I'm not getting more. I'm not getting any action on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. Mm, mm. Have Have you joined the program, by the way, the digital yes. digital solutions? Yes. Maybe you you might want to talk to a LinkedIn strategist around, um, you know, targeting higher value customers, um, and kind of positioning yourself to do that. Um, obviously, I can sort of give you some insights on that, but. Um, we do have people that are really highly specialized just in LinkedIn um, that might be of benefit. Um, who are you currently kind of? Uh, uh, I work with Rowan Lerner. Oh, okay, Rowan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, she'll, she, she will guide you in the right direction. And I'm sure she'll refer you to, uh, you know, whoever in the social media, because LinkedIn still is a social media yeah. um, world. You need to kind of, work with next but i definitely look, yeah definitely look into linkedin because if you haven't really used much of it then oh, no, i use it all the time yeah yeah do, but do you generate leads using it yeah yeah okay. uh, not really i haven't really because we've been uh, trying to get uh vets chiropractors and electricians okay yeah well you might be able to create an event or join, uh, jo like joint venture with a, an event that already serves that kind of crowd. Not sure if it exists in Brisbane, um, you know, the chiropractors and the physios and the vets and all this kind of thing. Kind of the allied health, would you say? Is that a preferred yeah. segment? Yeah. You yeah. Are you in Western Australia, Queensland or the Northern Queensland. Territory? Queensland. Yeah. So in WA, we've actually got an allied health incubator right out in the outskirts uh, in Wanneroo. Ram will know what I'm talking about there. Um, and that would be a place that you would organize potentially a, a get together and just talk about what you do and how you serve clients. And, and that could be a, a way to get people off LinkedIn and you know yeah, meet you face to face and build that um, familiarity and trust. Yeah. Um, yeah, cause there's a, that, that's quite a large market. Like there's a lot of psychologists, physiotherapists, chiropractors, um, and yeah, allied health professionals. And I think that that's a pretty good segment to go after actually. Um, yeah. 
good. And in the early days, you might just go to affluent events and just see what they've got. Um, I look at Eventbrite like a lot to see who's having events and why. And I really haven't noticed anything in the allied health space and I'm not really sure why. So it could be that, you know, there are activators in that space and you just need to know who they are and then pitch them in the idea of collaborating and getting all these people in the room and, you know, having some drinks and, and getting to know 30 or 40 of these people at, at a time. Or actually I've said maximum 30, so let's, let's stick to the 30 if possible. Um, but that could be a really good lead gen tool for you and a, you know, a brand awareness piece. And it probably only costs a couple hundred bucks to get together. Yep. No, that sounds good. Good show. Alrighty, guys. Well, it's a public holiday here, so I must retire to <laughs> my resting quarters. Thanks again, guys. And uh, yeah, I can send this link out to you if you want, um, uh, the actual presentation. I'll send it out um, maybe in the next couple of hours uh, to your email addresses and uh, hope to keep in touch with all of you. Thanks, Tristan. Wonderful. Enjoy your day off. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.